has today launched the future for women in sport choose what's next it is the fifth and final chapter of this campaign and the closing message from the movement highlights the choice that we have for what happens next for women in sport and calls on everyone involved in sport to ask questions of themselves and of society to shape the future that plays out choose what next is fronted by one of kpmg's ambassadors that is the dublin footballer sinead ahern but if you want to know more about this the best thing to do as well you'll find it on off the ball social channels or get onto 20 by 20 social channels because there is a youtube video an 11 minute documentary which tracks the journey with some brilliant archive footage from where women's sport has come from right through to the present day so you'll find that on off the ball social channels as well but it's brilliant to be joined by the captain of the three in a row winning Dublin footballer Sinead Ahern. How are you keeping Sinead? Not too bad Nathan, thanks for having me on. Before we get on to what's coming in terms of on the pitch over the next month or so, I just want to talk to you about this 20 by 20 movement and in some ways it's difficult with all that has gone on over the last six months of the pandemic to track the increase in participation and the increase in attendance numbers the way you would have liked to but what sort of change have you seen around women's sport over the last couple of years with this movement? Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's been different chapters, I suppose. Um, as you mentioned, this is the, the fifth and final one, but, um, you know, prior to that, you had, um, you know, very much a push to, to to get women in, you know, more visible in the media and, you know, to sort of emphasize the role of of, of them in, in being role models for, for kids coming up and, and to see uh, women's sport normalized. Um, and, and even back to the last chapter of, you know, no, no proving, just moving, uh, uh, just participation, not necessarily at a competitive level, but, you know, just to... to for people to get involved and to see sport very much as, as a daily part of their lives. So I think you've seen a lot more visibility um, and that sense of, of trying to, you know, ask the questions as to what more can we do? That, that's obviously the, the, the message for for closing the campaign as such. It, it has to end from, I suppose, a, 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 you know, a perspective of, of a campaign from a PR, but, but you know, not to, to lose momentum on it and really to sort of ask what do we need to do more of? And if we haven't achieved um, certain things along the way, how, how do we do that? And I think, you know, that, that goes across all aspects of society, whether it's the public watching games or media or brands or, or anybody out there as to, you know, how do we really get women uh, in, in sports out there and keep it out there? You're heading into what season 18 or 19 is it with the Dublin footballers <laughs> at this stage? Um, yeah, it's probably 17 or 18, possibly at this stage. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, and when you when you compare the young girls who are coming into that squad now, at maybe 17, 18, compared to the sort of landscape you were going into in terms of how elite female sports athletes are treated, and that is what uh, ladies footballers are at this stage, very much elite athletes. How different is it? A setup now compared to 17, 18 years ago? Yeah, I suppose from my own perspective with, with Dublin, it probably went through um, a big range of, of, of setups um, from, from when I got involved. I suppose it was Mick Bowen initially, and even at that stage, he was trying to bring as much professionalism uh, to it as possible. Um, having come from the, the, the men's game, I suppose, um, probably through years where we were struggling to get a manager in, um, you know, struggling to get access to facilities, pitches moving around, training session to training session to, I suppose, now being in a position where, you know, we've managed to establish a base for ourselves to, to have some success and, and to get more I suppose, structures around how, how we set up, and as you say, to try and, you know, be elite athletes and, and to achieve as much as you can. And I think that's, you know, probably still a challenge that's, you um, you know, too big for, for for some teams out there at the moment for some sports, and um, in that there's still a, a lot of barriers to, to trying to actually achieve that peak. There's a different expectation then it seems almost on female athletes and successful female athletes because listen, you want to win a fourth All Ireland in a row with Dublin. That is your aim going out. But also we're going to be talking about progressing the sport for all. And actually, mm -hmm. while it's great what's happening in Dublin, and it's great that you have AIG sponsoring. The men's team and the women's team and it does seem as though you get access to a lot of the same facilities you, you can tell us if there's if you feel there's a bit to go but also you want you know leitrim and clare and other counties that don't have that to get there and is it a difficult balance to get or do you find it quite easy actually to focus on the dublin side of things but also focus on the greater you know i want ladies football to be successful for for 20 years in all parts of the country a strong clare leitrim is good for dublin in the long run no, absolutely. I mean, you know, you, you look at, I suppose, Leinster uh, over the last few years has kind of fallen um, 
away in terms of the, the level of teams that are competing at, at ladies football and, and that's not good for the growth of the game um you know overall so you definitely want to see um teams being being brought through together and i suppose you know you mentioned that uh sponsors it's, it's not necessarily equal across uh the board in terms of you know brands looking to, to back teams i'd love to see that happen for, for men's and women's teams across the board that they're given um you know that 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 brand power um, behind them and given a level of investment to succeed. I mean, even I know the WGPA have been looking at um, that. They were report coming out in a couple of weeks, you know, around where are we at um, in ladies football and, and, you know, how do we move forward over the, the next few years? And, you know, we still have a situation where uh, there isn't really, um, you know, player expenses for, for that. And, you know, you have, uh, you know, counties that might have people living uh far outside the county traveling back for training and that and that's all off their own back and if we're, we're losing those players that aren't able to kind of keep giving that commitment then you know we're not building the game equally across the board so you know yeah. I, I definitely think that there's a lot of uh, structural changes that that still probably aren't uh, where they need to be um in the, in the ladies game to try and, and keep the progression uh, going and to, as i say try and keep it uh, as equal as, as we can how worried are you then about what's happened over the past six months? Because it does feel as though the conversation you might be having around expenses might be quite different now than a year ago because the economy is suffering, everybody is going to suffer financially of what's happened. Mm -hmm. And views from having quite a few conversations around this and, and women's sports seem to be quite mixed. On the one hand, you have a view that, well, women's sport has had to sort of scrap for everything anyways over recent years, sort of sort of used to that. It's not as if... Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the men's teams, they were had these luxurious surroundings and actually any little dip might be a bit of a change. You've always had to battle for everything, so you're used to it. But also there's been such progress and quite often because the men's side of the game is the main money earner, that's the thing that'll be protected. And the women's game is almost seen as something, you know, organizations have to do and it's something that they can cut back on and maybe people won't notice as much. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think it's a disappointing sort of short-termism attitude. I mean, in any in anything, if you don't invest in it, um, then how is it going to grow? Um, and, and you know, you'd have to think that the return on investment for for going into women's sports has to be something that's attractive to to brands to get involved in for for where we're going to next to really take a campaign and to be able to mold it to sort of get on board with the journey of a team or an athlete. Um, you know, for for a brand coming in and, and to sort of to see a vision for that and and to actually you know go after it. I think. Um, there has to be a uh, value for money in, in doing that women's sport. This is, you know, what do you want to say about women's sport in the future, you know, for your daughter, for your sister, for your girlfriend, your wife, whoever it is, what opportunities do you want them to have? And, you know, I think even for the likes of government funding, I think it needs to be actually biased towards women to, to sort of close that gap of, of investment that's been put into to sports uh, over the years because we're obviously coming from a much lower base uh, and, mm to sort of compare the output of men's and women's sport and say, well, you know, women's sport isn't as good, it doesn't attract the crowds. You know, you're not comparing like with like in terms of what's actually been put into it to put the structures in place to have them achieve uh, their, their abilities, I feel. There's still a, a major disparity as well in who's running the various different governing bodies. And you see somebody like Sarah Keane, very much in charge of the Olympic Council, strongly linked with potentially being the next CEO of the FAI. And, and hopefully there is more of that. But how important is it that more and more female voices are in the room when those decisions have been making and are in a position to lobby because like it still does seem mad with all this debate and conversation over the last five six years that's really increased that like there is still government funding that isn't been divided 50 50 like, that we aren't at a sort of title nine moment like they have in the usa where you have to have a 50 50 split that any government funding towards sport has to be split evenly do you just need a better lobby group to get there yeah i suppose look i'd be i'd be lying if i said i'm fully up on all the inner politics of, of how it works um in, in terms of, of the lobbying and all the rest of it but yeah no i do i think i'd agree with you need to have more more voices in there and i know look there's an argument there to say you know gender quotas aren't the way to go around you know getting the best people in the, into the position but oftentimes you just aren't even hearing that you know the women's side of things it's not even on the agenda or it's not even in the thinking um of 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 this you know a, a lot of these sports and structures and institutions were built by men for men and it's it's you know actually trying to break down those barriers across the society and, and see that well, well we need to put this on the agenda and how do we best do that you know in the media is it a, a quota or ratio that that you know uh, broadcasters and, and newspapers, etc., are signing up to. Um, in NGVs, is it a you know certain board quota of, of of women? And 
you know, I, I subscribe some value to, to saying that the best people should be in those positions. But if we don't give people experience, if we don't give them training, then, you know, how are they actually supposed to grow that uh, into that position? And I think there's probably been a lot of thought put into that, um, you know, around the, 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 the sports policies for, for women that are, are being, you know, put together and hopefully put into practice over the, the next few years. But it's definitely areas, yeah, that, that we need to uh, keep the foot in the pedal for. Mm. The NGBs do seem to be crucial. I was at a 20 by 20 debate about six months ago where the discussion has what is next. And yes, the media does have a, a big role to play in that. But everybody on that panel seemed to feel actually it comes down to the governing bodies, that what happens from this 20 by 20 movement comes down to what the GAA, the FAI, the IRF you do and how they're held to account in terms of funding. And probably never more so than in the next six months when cutbacks are coming as to how they go and do that. The debate may spark up again then around where ladies football fits in. Do you want to be inside the tent or outside the tent? What's your preference? Um, look, I, I can see there's definitely, you, you wouldn't want a situation where let's say the Camogie Association, the OGFA were to, to, you know, be blended into the GAA and lose a voice in terms of, you know, the experience that they've built up over the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years in, in the case of Camogie, let's say, or, you know, it's a, a little less in, in LGFA and, and the specific uh, identification of the women's issues and women's programs and, and you know not all issues are the same so you wouldn't want to lose I suppose that that knowledge base and that application to having dedicated um you know programs that that serve that but equally as you say um you know we don't own any of our own facilities so we're very dependent on the GEA from, from that aspect um in terms of fixtures um you know even the likes of let's say the All Ireland final is, is scheduled for the 20th of December would there have been a need to have that on the 20th of December for, for the women's side of things uh, in football, given we've less fixtures to fulfill? I don't know. But is it a case that we couldn't get into, you know, uh, uh, Crow Park for, for a final before that date? Those are all the kind of questions that, that you'd have. Um, I think it's probably the way to go down the line, but, but we probably just aren't quite there yet in terms of how we'd integrate that. And I think there needs to be a clear vision for how to do that. That facility side of thing is probably something that may come into sharp focus over the coming months because mm -hmm. you are probably only a, a week or so away maybe from resuming inter-county training and we're going into the winter at a time when games generally end up being called off and I don't know if that is a bit of a concern when you look at the calendar, it's so tight for the men's game and the women's game, there's very little wiggle room, particularly with the way the men's inter-county set up that are you concerned you get to a stage where county boards are protecting pitches and again that the women's game is sort of, well, maybe you can go over here and actually we'll protect the main pitch for the men. Yeah, and, and look, I suppose there's lots of questions over that as to, you know, let's say, for instance, if, if we're end up training in DCU, what's happening with college fixtures? Nobody knows that at the moment. Will you have a, a situation where those fixtures will go ahead um, for both men and women, or will it be a case that they're pulled back? Um, and then if they're not, you know, I still don't think that it's feasible to have a championship uh, run in the winter where you don't have access to changing facilities. So if you then need to be in a situation where you need two dressing rooms to have adequate social distancing, how does that work? You know, it, it puts even more pressure on it. So I think we've had a pretty wet summer, um, unfortunately. So I don't think pitches are going to be in great nick um, going into going into the winter to, to start off. So yeah, I, I, they're all questions. I don't know um, how it'll play out. Um, and, I, and as you say, just to kind of go back to your point earlier, around, you know, you'd hope it's equal access across, uh, you know, all the counties that are competing in terms of trying to get access. I know, you know, you've ladies, uh, county teams out there that are paying for facilities that are, you know, being provided by, by men's teams. And it's a huge concern for, for cost as much as, you know, how do we actually get onto pitches to get the playing time that, that we need. So, yeah, um, lights even, you know, on, on, on pitches and, and venues as well. And uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of questions that uh, we just don't know how they're going to play out, unfortunately usually would you train the same night as the men's team? Um, generally not, I don't think. Um, I think they'd have a lot more Saturday games typically than, than we would. Um, but yeah, I, I don't I, I don't know their, their arrangements, I suppose, for, for where they're basing themselves out of uh, under Desi Farrell. So. It's obviously a very fluid situation. Even today we see there's a plan for the pubs to reopen in a couple of weeks, yet there's these warning shots for people in Dublin and Limerick that there may be some form of a lockdown. So it is incredibly difficult to plan, and I'm sure it's very difficult for Mick Bowen and, and the Dublin backroom staff to try and put something in place for the next month. Do you have any idea as to what training is going to look like in 10 days' time with the Dublin Senior Football Squad? Um, not not, not really a, a full picture, I suppose. Yeah, there's there's... You know what you talked about there we're still uh, at the moment under a sort of you know i think a 15 people uh, sort of 
group limit if you're if you're training outdoors, but that's due to be lifted, uh, hopefully, um, if, if the next announcement comes around. So, uh, you know, it's tricky. You still can't be indoors in, in, in a group setting if, if, you know, you're looking to do some, you know, meetings or, or you know, gym work or that type of thing. So um, there's just lots of questions. And I know it's been difficult um, for, the, for the guys to plan. And obviously, when you come back together as a team, you're, you're hoping to build that sort of teamwork and a sense of, uh, of everyone, um, you know, being, being all fully on the same page. And that's going to be difficult to do because, you know, I don't even know if we'll be able to meet as, as one panel and one management team in, in any sort of space. Yeah, do you, like, I guess you have no choice but to just suck it up this season and hope that come 2021 yeah. things are better because it is an amateur sport. You do it for the love of it. Yeah, you want to go and win, but there's going out there on a Tuesday, Thursday night and with your mates and having a bit of a laugh and having a bit of crack. It, it all feels like it's going to be very serious and also with everybody watching and that sort of blame culture of waiting for somebody to slip up. Yeah, I, I do. I think it's going to be a different experience. I, I think it's going to be more of a, as you say, yeah you sort of enjoy the journey as much as the destination on it. I think this journey is going to be looking a lot different and there'll definitely be a different feel to it. So it is a case of, look, uh, if it's a case of no football or, or it's adapting to, to, you know, whatever we have to do, I don't think it will be the same experience uh, that we've been used to and, and whether that'll be any less or more enjoyable, I don't know. But um, yeah, I guess everyone's on the in the same boat on that one. Yeah, like even from a health and safety point of view, I think mid-pandemic, everyone was just let us out there. We don't care what the conditions are like, but I see some yeah. of the Clare footballers today as well uh, saying that you know they you know, they need to drive for two hours and they need to have a shower. They can't just Absolutely. get back in their car. Yeah. Like, these yeah. are actual, these are, are real concerns the players will have. They are genuine concerns, particularly when you're, you know, we're now looking at a situation where players have probably started last November, December, and will be running more than 12 months in a season, um, albeit there's been a gap in the middle, but you nearly had a, a, a trickier period where people were trying to keep themselves going, you know, taking over training on their own. So you've then gone into a club championship and now beginning an inter-county season this late in the year is, is you know, completely new and, and how quickly we're going to have to try and get up to inter-county standard again when, when we get back together just isn't feasible for me not to have meeting facilities or, you know, uh, changing facilities when you're in a winter position. You're not able to stand around uh, a tactics board for 20 minutes in the middle of November trying to figure out, you know, your kick-out strategy or whatever it is. So um, I think they're all things that have to be looked at. And, you know, I hope that if, you know, if we are in a situation where we need to, to meet in smaller groups or, you know, have limited uh, indoor contact that, you know, there's some sort of guidelines put in place or, or facilities that are equally made available for, for men's and women's sports to be able to, to try and work within that. One thing is sure when it does resume, you'll be hot favourites for four in a row, but it's uh, not much wiggle room, not much room for error in this new setup in the ladies championship. You're in a group with Donegal and Waterford, one team progresses, so you've got to be on it right from the start. Yeah, and I think that's probably, you know, something we've probably been able to feel our way into the championship a little bit more in, in, in previous years and to sort of have six or seven weeks when you get back together, not being able to sort of knit yourselves together, even in that environment as closely as you would want, um, to, to, to see where you're at and, and to sort of six weeks later, as I say, you can't go out sort of blown cold on the first day. You have to be hitting the ground running. And um, I think that's a huge challenge for the you know for the management team and the players to, to try and get their heads around. But look, that's a new challenge for us. And, and every year you're kind of coming back with uh, hoping to, to, I guess, bring something new and bring something different to it. So uh, this, this is the year where we've, we'll have a, a, lot of, a lot of new stuff thrown at us. And I guess it'll just be a yeah, down to see who adapts. I'm sure Donny will be uh, looking forward to that match anyway. A bit of yeah. a, a one-off feel. Sinead, it's been brilliant to talk to you. Thanks a lot uh, for taking the time out. And well done as well for your involvement. I know you've been a big supporter and very much involved in this 20 by 20 movement over the last couple of years. We're going to talk a lot more about it over the next month and just how much of a success it has been and what does happen next. What is the next stage of this? And that is the question in this part and this fifth and final chapter of the campaign, the future for women in sport, choose what's next. There's a brilliant documentary. It's up on YouTube now. It's an 11 minute documentary charting the journey, lots of archive footage to examine where women's